Why Israel? What is so special about Israel? We are a generation who see the miracle happen before our very eyes that the Jewish people are returning back to the promised land. There are many scriptures, prophecies in the Bible that speak about it. Let's turn to one, which is Isaiah 43. There the Lord God says to his Jewish people, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. When you hear north, south, east, west, of course you have to put your feet in Jerusalem, in Israel. And then look on the map of the world to the north and to the south and to the east and to the west. Now, when God says, I will bring your children from the east, it means looking at it from Israel, from the Middle East and from the Far East. And we've seen the Jews come returning to the land from all the countries of the Middle East, even from China, even from Japan. And some Jewish organizations have asked our help to even help bring back uh, descendants of the tribe of Manasseh who are on the border of India to come back to the promised land. That's the east. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. Now the west, looking at it from Jerusalem, is of course Europe and even further the Americas. And we've seen them come from the concentration camps of Europe, like skeletons almost. When you read Ezekiel 37, the Valley of the Dry Bones, you can almost see physically the pictures of these starved victims of terror in the concentration camps of Europe. But they have come from the West and entered into the Promised Land. I will say to the North, give them up. And the north, of course, is, is first Turkey and the former Soviet republics, but ultimately it's Russia itself. And I think from Russia in the last 15 years, 1.2 million Jews have returned to the promised land. We as Christians for Israel International have helped them. I think we provided funds with your help. Uh, for uh, almost 90,000 Jews to make Aliyah, that's the name for it, the return to the land, to make Aliyah from the Ukraine, where up to a million Jews were still living back to the promised land. That's from the north. And I think deep down that the whole breakdown of communism in Russia and in the former Soviet Union was for this reason. Of course, it's wonderful that Christians now have freedom of religion over there, much more than they used to have in the past, and that the spreading of the gospel is possible there. But prophetically, the Iron Curtain, I think, came down just because it was time that the Jews from the land of the north, from Russia, could come out to return to the Promised Land, because God is involved in this. And to the south, do not hold them back. The south is, of course, Africa. It's Ethiopia. The black Jews from Ethiopia are coming back to the land. And from other countries in Africa, even from South Africa, the whole process of returning to the land from the four corners of the earth is in process today. We see it with our very eyes. The Lord God says, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. My sons, my daughters. That's how God speaks about the Jewish people. My sons, my daughters. The father and his sons and daughters. Everyone who is called by my name, Israel, bears the name of God. It is Israel. El, and El means God, like in Emmanuel, God with us. El, God. Everyone who's called by my name, whom I created for my glory, 
Israel was created for God's glory. They're a special people. They're apart from any other people on this planet. He created Israel, even literally so, because Abram was too old and Sarah was too old to get children. But Isaac was born as a miracle of God, my firstborn son, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So we see this process taking place, 1948, the new state of Israel was born, 1967, Jerusalem united as the capital city of Israel. Again, there's a Jewish state in the Middle East and prophecies are being fulfilled right before our very eyes. And we can be involved, we can help, we can support, we can have solidarity with this newborn state. In the last program, we spoke about Islam and about Jerusalem. And now that Israel is back on stage, we see all these problems developing in the Middle East. So deep down, this whole conflict in the Middle East is a spiritual conflict. It's a battle between the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and all the other gods of this world, which will ultimately lead to more and more clashes in the Middle East. Now, don't be mistaken, this whole conflict is not between Jews and Arabs. As you know, the Jews are coming from Isaac. Abram was the first, he got a son Isaac, he got a son Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. That's Israel. Goes back to Abraham through Isaac. But Abraham had another son called Ishmael. And the Arabs are coming from Abraham through the line of Ishmael. In the Quran even they claim that it was not Isaac that was almost sacrificed by father Abraham, but it was Ishmael, that he was the first, etc. Now let's look at that situation between Isaac and Ishmael and we will look at it from the scriptures in Genesis 17 you know God had called Abraham from Ur to go to the promised land he had promised him in Genesis 12 that there would be a land there would be a people there would be a blessing and all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him now to to be a people, you at least need one son in order to multiply. And God says, yes, you will have a son, Abraham, but time goes on and on and on. No son, no child. Sarah, his wife, is barren. And then, well, and we sometimes do the same. We have the promise of God and we wait, but nothing happens. And then we say, well, maybe we should use our brains and do something ourselves as well. And so then Abram says, maybe we should adopt Eliezer, who was the servant who really run the whole operation of Abram, the flocks, the cattle, uh, everything. Why don't we adopt him as son? Then when we die, he will be the heir to all of that. And then we have a son, and then he can have children, and maybe that's what the Lord wants. No, says God, that's not what I want. You will have a son of your own. But time goes by, no son. Then they start thinking, maybe we should do something else. Maybe it should be a real son, biologically speaking, from the seed of Abram. But maybe we can use this beautiful woman from Egypt. Sarah says, I have a wonderful slave by the name of Hagar. Why don't you use her as a kind of substitute mother, Abraham? Then maybe a son will be born. We adopt this child as our son, and then it's really your son. Well, they think that's a splendid idea. So... Abraham takes Hagar, and yes, she becomes pregnant. And yes, 
a son is born by the name of Ishmael. So now finally they think the problem is solved. And then we come to Genesis 17. God said to Abraham in verse 15, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. As of nothing has happened so far. Doesn't God know? Abram thinks that I already have a son. We read, Abram fell face down. He laughed. He fell face down. He doesn't dare to laugh into God's face directly. But he laughs. He says, Lord, this is... What is this? I'm far too old to have children. And my wife as well. This is impossible, don't you know? But it's not necessary. So he said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abram said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. God, I have a son. His name is Ishmael. Couldn't not he be the son you have in your mind? Why don't you, you make him live under your blessing? Then God said, no, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. You will have a son. The name will be Isaac. And the covenant I will make with him. The covenant I made with you, Abram, I will make with Isaac as well. And later I will make it with Jacob as well, his son. The covenant. But as far as Ishmael is concerned, I have heard you. And I'll tell you this. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful, will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers. I will make him into a great nation. So blessings for Ishmael, but the covenant for Isaac. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abram, God went up from him. Blessings for Ishmael, and God kept his word. Today, there are over 300 million Arabs in the world. They live in an enormous amount of land, over 20 uh, separate states in the Middle East. They have huge amounts of oil. They're so powerful, they can choke the economy of the world if they like. So God kept his promise. He has blessed Ishmael. But the covenant is with Isaac. Now I have Jewish friends who tell me, I wish we had the blessing instead of the covenant. Because the covenant with God means that you bear the name of God, Israel. That you are his representative in the world. That you're the representative of the one and only holy God. And that means that the world will hate you. Hate you. And so you will suffer. To be the chosen one, you will suffer. To be chosen means suffering. There's no people that has suffered so much in the world than the covenant people Israel. And the great chosen one from Israel, Jesus, their greatest son, you might say, has suffered like nobody else in this world. And the church, the chosen one from the Gentile nations by faith in Christ and grafted upon the old root, is suffering. When you are the chosen one, you suffer. When you are 
covenant people with God, the powers of darkness in this world, they simply don't want you. So Jews tell me, we wish we would have had the blessings like Ishmael. Look, there are only 15 million Jews left in the world. That's all there is after the massacres of the ages. We live in a small strip of land. We have no oil, we have nothing. We only have the name of God, and we are his representatives. So, the problem in the Middle East is not that you are a descendant of Isaac, or that you are a descendant of Ishmael, that you are a Jew or an Arab. The problem is that the descendants of Ishmael, the Arabs, and not just them, but also the Indonesians and the Pakistani and the Chechens and the Sudanese, etc., have fallen into the hands of another god. That's the problem, the heart of the problem in the Middle East. Now, how will this end? Will ultimately Allah be all-powerful? No. We know from the scriptures that one day, as Paul says in his epistle to the Philippians, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One day, the neck of Allah will be broken. And we read it already in Isaiah 19. We read at the end of that chapter, in that day, when finally the power of Islam has gone, in that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. Assyria is today's Iraq. The old highway that has been there for many centuries will function again. And the Egyptians and the Assyrians will worship together the Lord. No longer Allah, but the Lord, meaning the four letters of the unspeakable name of God. Yehaveh in Dutch. Sometimes it's said Yahweh or Jehovah. Jews will never pronounce that name. It's the holy name. They call it the name. Or they call it Adonai. Replacing these letters by other letters, which means Lord. Then the Assyrians and the Egyptians will worship the one and only name of God. And they will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, Worshipping the Lord, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. God is moving forward. Tensions are on the rise of the Middle East. All the other gods and religions will will try to do anything to frustrate the work of God, but God is in control, and it will finally lead to the coming of his kingdom and the coming of the king of, the, of this kingdom, being Jesus Christ our Lord, who is coming in glory, and peace shall flow forth from Jerusalem and cover the earth, and the nation shall train for war no more, and people are free, made free from hatred, from war, from anything bad, because the powers of darkness have been defeated forever and ever. Jesus Christ is coming because the Jews are coming home. Praise the Lord. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn salvation like a blazing torch.